Um, where do I know? Let's go here to, to Mashery. Uh, Mashery is a, is a partner of ours. They, um, they're what's called an API curator. Go ahead and sign in. They've got over 50 APIs that they helped customers build and host. And uh, one of the ones that I've worked with is uh, Rotten Tomatoes. So I've just logged in. You can see all the different API keys I have. So once you start to work with these open data APIs, there's some things you need to know about them. Many of them require you to get a developer key. It usually doesn't cost anything. You just have to register, and then they give you a key. Uh, so for example, if I go to the dynamic documentation here for Rotten Tomatoes, which is movie information, I've logged in so they know, they know what my key is. And I've just selected my developer key and now I can, I can use this API Explorer, which is in the browser, it's just a browser app. Um, and I can say, okay, I'm interested in building an app using the in-theaters data. Let me go ahead and try it. I wanna see how this works. So I try it out, and what I see is, let me zoom in here. You can, you can actually see what the API that, that they just fired, what it looks like, it's a URL and it's got some parameters on it, and it, and it ends with my developer key. So they know that the, who's, who's making this call. And um, they send you back you know, what the data uh, would look like, which is right here. So again, I'll, I'll zoom in so we can see it a little better. This, this is the data coming back, and it's coming back as JSON, JavaScript object notation. So why, why does it do that? Well, APIs that are on the internet are architected to return very chunky data. Think of this, if you wanted to write an app that went and built a list of movies that someone could go see in a theater, would you wanna make a call and say, okay, give me a movie, and that's one call. Now make another call, give me the second movie. Now give me the third movie, and you're doing that on the internet, and you know how internet connectivity is, you know, we're only at the very beginning of what the capabilities of that are from an infrastructure perspective. It's not, it's not always perfect, it's not always fast, it's not always there. So chunky data makes a lot more sense. Go get me 16 movies all right, at a time or 20 movies at a time. And not only that, not just the name of the movie, give me the title, the year, the rating, Give me a critic's consensus. Give me the release date. Give me a synopsis. Give me movie poster thumbnails. So uh, it's pulling back a ton of information. Who are all the actors in the film? All right, that's chunky data. That way you can make one API call on this you know, not very um, reliable internet connection. Get back a lot of data and now use it in the app. That makes a lot more sense. So this is the classic they used to call it, chunky versus chatty, right? We want, we want our open data APIs to be chunky. Another thing you need to be aware of uh, about uh, these APIs is they are sometimes throttled, which means the, the folks who are hosting the, this, a, these APIs and they're providing all this data for free, you get a developer key, but they might tell you you can only make two calls per second and no more than 10,000 calls a day. That might be one level of threshold. Another one might be you can make you know, five calls per second, uh, but you're limited to 100 calls a day. And if you wanna do more than 100 calls a day, you need to pay us, right? So there's those kinds of uh, uh, scenarios as well. So do your research into the APIs you're interested in using, determine if, if they are uh, bottlenecked in any way, if there's a threshold, a cap, um, is there a cost? You know, what do you have to do to get a developer key? But then once you figure that out and you say, yeah, this is a reasonable API, it's open, it's free, it's not throttled, you know, it, I can build an app and I can get a thousand people using my app and all calling that API and I shouldn't have, I shouldn't exceed any threshold. That's kind of where you want to be to leverage these APIs. So I found my API, uh, I'm happy with the threshold limit, now I want to build an app.
So, the place to start. When I go ahead and run this application, at least you'll see what it looks like. Then I'm going to come back and we'll walk through it. We'll probably set some breakpoints. So, another thing I'm pointing out here, this is the Windows 8 emulator. So, this is another way to run and debug your Windows 8 app. So, we have a phone emulator. We also have a, um, uh, a tablet emulator that's built into the tools. So, you can run the app. I could run this app locally on my machine, but I could also test it in this, in this uh, uh, simulator. Uh, so, again, I can make sure that uh, uh, I could simulate touch and I could change the resolution. That's another uh, nice feature of this. Windows runs on a lot of different devices. You want to make sure that if you're building an app for Windows, that it'll work on anything from the size of a Surface all the way up you know, to one of these. Right? So built into the uh, uh, simulator is the ability to change the screen resolution so you could actually see if, you are, if your layout is working regardless of what monitor uh, the user happens to be using. So here I am. I just made that API call to, uh, to Rotten Tomatoes, and I got back uh, a bunch of movies which are in theaters, and I could select one of those movies, and now I can see, you know, I, I, before I got a thumbnail of the poster, now I can actually see this movie poster, and I'm getting the synopsis and the rating and the audience score. So I didn't have to, I pulled that data all the way back, right? So it came back, it's in my app, I'm now run, you know, working with this data completely locally on the device. And I could say, now I'm interested in some reviews. Now I'm going back out to the internet. As soon as I said I want to, you know, look at some reviews of this movie, what Rotten Tomatoes gave me back was a, was a link to another API that I can invoke to get a list of reviews. And then for each review now is actually a web page. So I'm trying to connect to the New Yorker right now. And hopefully that'll come up in a second. But I can see the list of, of reviews here on the left-hand side, and I can actually read the review of the Despicable Me now in the New Yorker. All right? So that's what the app does. So the way I, I uh, built this app is I, uh, one of the nice things about Rotten Tomatoes, they actually give you nine different APIs that you can use. The way they design them, though, is pretty clever. Every API returns the same format of data. So this is an interesting thing. Another interesting thing you'll find when you start to dig into these open data APIs. Some of them are well designed, some of them are not. Or some of them just, ha they weren't able to do something based on the data they're returning that is as um, clean as this. So each one of these APIs, and I've got them documented in my code, returns the same structure. It's a list of movies, as you saw before in that, that JSON that I showed you. Um, I've also written uh, a, a sample app that uses Edmunds, which is, if you've ever been to Edmunds.com, that's where you can go look up new and used car information. Right? So they have a developer API. Their develop, developer API is one of the most complex that I've seen because they have a vehicle API, they have a dealer API, that they have a deals API, um, and they have, uh, I believe, a reviews API. And then, so each one of those APIs is actually a collection of calls, and each one of their calls returns a different format. So you actually have to study each individual API and, and determine what the structure of it is to be able to deal with the data. So again, just be aware of that. So I've defined uh, the APIs for Rotten Tomatoes. I've got them all defined in here, so I can actually change this application to, to not show in theaters information. I could change it to show DVD top rentals. So how would I do that? Well, let's see. The best way to understand this is to probably set a few breakpoints. So let's see. We're going to set a breakpoint right there and right there. So this is, this is the point in code where I'm actually going to invoke the in theaters API. 
It's defined as a string. The next thing that happens is we take that and we use a, an object in the WinRT class library called HTTP client. That's the class that allows me to invoke a URL. So I simply instantiate that and I call the get string async that makes that API call. We'll set a breakpoint here as well so we can see what comes back. The next thing I do, now remember, that comes back as JavaScript object notation. It's going to come back as a string, a giant string that has all that movie information in it. So how do I deal with it in my application? The first step I have to do is do something called deserialization. And there's a library that does it for me. It takes that string and it will deserialize it into an object model in memory for me. So the only extra work I had to do was actually define what that object model is. Well, there are tools that do that for you automatically. So you don't have to necessarily write that code. But once that code is generated, you end up with a class that looks something like this. So I've got Rotten Tomatoes Movies, has a collection of type movie, and a movie is made up of an ID and a title and a year and a rating and a runtime. This is all that same information you saw in the JSON, right? But now it's represented as, C, as a C-sharp class. And so the deserialization process takes the string of JSON and turns it into a runtime object model based on the, this class structure here. One line of code does that. All right. You simply have to have the class to define, and there are tools that generate it for you. And it's this line of code right here that actually does the work. All right. So we'll we'll uh, we'll walk through that now. When when I, remember we're using model view view model, right? But what I get back from Rotten Tomatoes is not a view model; it's a data model. So I, now that I have all this movie information, it's extremely rich. It's more information than I want to put on the screen. And it's not in the format that's bindable to the user interface controls. So I have to map from the data model to a view model, and then after that, one line of code binds it to the UI. So I have to define my view model. So a view model would look something like this. It's a movie, well, this is the reviews. Let me scroll down, I'll get to the movie information. We'll start there. I have a movie item. It's derived from this base class. Now, what, why is that? Well, let me scroll up, because I scrolled past it already. On Windows, what makes a class bindable is that it implements the interface I notify property changed. Model view, view model means that you, you put your data in the form of a view model, you bind it to the UI control, could be a list view, could be a drop down, a combo box, uh, a grid control, something like that. If the user interacts with it and changes it, you want your view model to be notified that the data has changed. If your program changes the view model, you want the model view to be notified that the data has changed and update automatically. All of that machinery of keeping the model view in sync with the, with the view model, the model view in sync with the view model, is handled automatically by the platform. Whether you're HTML5 and JavaScript or you're C Sharp XAML, C++, that's handled automatically. You simply have to derive from the right, you know, implement the right interface. In this case, it's I notify property changed. And there's the implementation. So now that that's implemented, I can now derive classes from this base class that are my view model. And that's all that this, that's going on in this, this particular uh, file right here. So if I come down, where was I? Uh, movie item. All right, so here's my movie item that's bindable. And it's simply got, it defines the data that I want to be able to put on the screen and then accessors, get and set accessors. That's it. Very straightforward code. And I'm being instant messaged by someone out at corporate. So just ignore that. Uh, so let's see. So that's the view model. 
The last thing I want to show you is, okay, if now that I'm, uh, everything's in the view model, then what happens? Well, 